Good. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rachel Cardwell, not Joe Sylvester. Hopefully you'll get to meet her at some point. Um, she's lovely and I'm going to be a, a poor stand-in for her today, but I'll do my best. Um, about a year ago, maybe even further back than a year, yeah, Josh? I'm not actually sure. Yeah. Um, you may remember a woman named Penny Pritchard. Uh, Penny worked for us up until, golly, late fall 2020. Um, and I think was a regular attendee of your meetings and built great relationships and she worked for Friends of the Children. So I'm here to provide an update on what the organization has been up to since she departed uh, our, not the world, the organization, um, and uh, that you gave us a gift um, that made very possible um, our forever home, which is just down the road on Old Bed Redmond Highway. Um, but I want to start with kind of a recap of what we do, who we are, and why we, why and how we help kids locally. Um, so we have a big mission. We are predicated much like many other youth serving organizations in the world. Uh, my personal career has spent time with Boys and Girls Club, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. All of these organizations that work with at-risk kids are built on, on one well-known fact, one thing that's been researched and, and proven over and over, over decades of research when it comes to at-risk kids. And that is the single most impactful element for a kid who is facing trauma or struggles in life in general, the single most important factor in helping that kid come out of trauma, build resilience, and launch into adulthood successfully is a long-term relationship with a caring adult. Very often for these kids, that adult is not their caregiver. That adult is not their parent. That adult is not a family member. And so our model, while different from those organizations, is built on that same truth. We know that a long-term relationship with a caring, stable adult can help a child who has been impacted by the worst trauma you could imagine will help that child launch into adulthood and life successfully. So let's talk about that a little bit. This is what we do. It is a really simple model that we operate in. We take long-term salaried mentors. All of, our, all of our mentors in our organization are full-time salaried employees. Um, while volunteers are incredibly important in the world, and I would never speak ill about a volunteer or their service to community, we know that for the kids that we worked with, a full-time employee that has training and background in working with kids with trauma is essential. We take these long-term salaried employee, employees to mentor kids who are facing the highest risk. We spend a lot of time talking about something called an ACE, which is an adverse childhood experience. Um, and there are all kinds of ACEs. Kids with divorced parents have one ACE. Our kids, typically when we meet them in kindergarten, have six. And divorced parents are the least of their troubles. They are the children of incarcerated parents. They are children who have, um, who have been severely abused as little kids. Um, and because we start so early, all of our kids start in our program between the ages of four, uh, four and six. Can you imagine a six-year-old who has already had six of those experiences? And that's on average. We have more. We have a couple that are a little less, but that's an average. And so what do we do? We pair those two people, those kids and those mentors, for 12 and a half years, no matter what. And there should be, there should be a little asterisk. Clearly, if the child moves out of our service area, we wouldn't be able to continue a mentorship relationship with a kiddo who has moved to Boise or, or that. Um, but we do make a commitment within the Central Oregon region. Um, if a kiddo in Bend moves to Madras, their friend drives to Madras to continue that level of service. If a kiddo at Madras enters foster care and is placed in a home in Lapine, that mentor travels to Lapine to continue that consistent relationship with the kid. So let's dig in a little bit further because there's actually a little more nuance than that. Those long-term salaried mentors paired with the kids facing the highest risks, those mentors spend four hours a week, every week, with the kids on their roster. 
and each one of our mentors has eight kids on their roster. So four hours a week, two hours in school. We partner with teachers, um, with school administrators to make sure that we have access to the classroom, which was no small feat during COVID, let me tell you. Um, and there were certainly some early days where we were sitting side by side with our kids as they were engaging in distance learning. Uh, making sure that they were logged in, making sure that they had their homework completed, making sure that they were on track in school. Uh, with the return to the classroom, a lot of that time this past year has been reorienting them to a classroom environment, helping them settle down and find their footing in what classroom settings are, helping them recognize what is triggering poor behavior in a classroom setting, um, and making sure that they find their confidence in their school work once again. So those four hours, the other two are spent in community. They're doing outings um, and all of, these, all of these experiences between the mentor and the kid helps them achieve what we refer to as roadmap goals. Every year, the mentor and the child sits down and says, what do you want to accomplish this year? Let's set some goals down, let's articulate things. And for our five-year-olds, that is learning to ride a bike. And for our nine-year-olds, that is climbing to I was going to say South Sister, that, but that's probably a bit more than they would buy off and chew. But we spend a lot of time at, at then Rock Gym and then the circuit, and they want to climb all the way to the, to the top of the challenge. They recognize that's not something they know how to do. Um, it's going to take physical skill as well as, well as like emotional resilience and commitment and perseverance, because they're going to fall. They're going to be scared. Uh, they're going to not know where to put their hand next. These are the skills that we're working through building, these soft skills of perseverance and grit, self-determination and confidence. Those are the things every single one of our activities seeks to instill and grow in these kids. So those roadmap goals are all based around those core assets of perseverance and whatnot. And then we do that. We set new goals. We achieve new heights every year that the child is in our program. It's important to say that um, we would never kick a child out of our program. If they opt to move, if the family moves out of our service area, that would be the only reason that we would unenroll a child. We stick with them through thick and thin. Through thick and thin. These are our people. These are our mentors today, Colleen, Corey, Danny, Aaron, Flavius, Brandy, and Ryan. They are the magic makers. They're the ones spending time with kids and, as I will say, or be accused of saying, they sit in the muck with our kids. In the chaos and crisis of their lives, they are there as that stable, consistent person. And not just for the child. Very often we see our caregivers, our parents, calling them as well. We had a family this last uh, summer who was being kicked out of their apartment. Our friend showed up with his truck and helped them load their stuff and found a place for them to stay so they didn't have to pitch a tent on the side of 97. That's what our <coughs> friends do. That time spent is individualized and intentional. We don't waste minutes. We spend so few relatively with these kids. Every minute is spent working toward uh, building those core resiliencies in these kids. Um, grade level, age level appropriate activities always, but we're in it for the long haul. We see the game as it needs to be played and the finish line for us um, is what we keep our sights on. We are there wherever, whenever that kiddo or that family needs us. So what do we see? Uh, Friends of the Children Central Oregon started in 2017. That means we are knocking on five years old. That means our oldest kids today are in fourth grade. Our original enrollees have persisted and, and are, are wrapping up fourth grade, but we have kiddos in kindergarten, wrapping up kindergarten this year too. We'll continue to enroll and have um, eventually a child in every grade across the spectrum enrolled in our program. Um, so we are one of the younger chapters of a national network. Friends of the Children has existed in our country for 30 years. The original chapter is in Portland, um, and now we're as far as LA, New York, Boston. We're setting new sites in Phoenix, and um, we just opened Colorado Springs. Uh, a really wonderful uh, Western Montana branch is about to open as well, so we're growing. Um, and across that national network for 30 years, 
we, are, we have tracked data. What's the impact of our program on the kids that we serve? Through our model, we're seeing an 83% high school graduation rate, which is astounding when you think the kids in our program, by and large, come from parents who didn't graduate from high school. They didn't even go to high school. 92% of these kids are moving on to full-fledged adulthood. They're going to college. They're entering a trade or the military. They are um, finding real living wage jobs and not, not your average, I'm not gonna make this even, anyway, sorry. Uh, but you know where I'm at. They're, they're productive, contributing members of our communities, right? We've given them the skills to launch into that effectively. 93% of them finished high school without ever having interacted with juvenile justice. This is a really big deal. Kids who engage with juvenile justice in their teen years are vastly more likely to enter the prison system as adults. And so if we can keep them out of that system as kids, they are well on their way to not having that be an experience of theirs as an adult. 98% of them are avoiding becoming parents themselves as teenagers. And every single one of them are kids of parents who became parents when they were teens. So those four things, those are the four things we track. Those are our big outcomes that we measure for each of our kids at the end of the time that they're with us. And if we hit where we want with all four of those, we have broken a generational cycle of abuse, poverty, and neglect for those kids who have, who have completed our program. We know how to break the cycle. It takes intense, long-term services, but we feel really proud to say that we've done it. And why is that important? Why is it important to break those cycles? Why is it important to pull kids out of a generational experience of living below the poverty line, living within um, within foster care and juvenile justice and prison sentences and all of these things, it's a money answer. So it doesn't grow on trees, but for every 100 kids that come through our program, 24 more will graduate from high school, 30 fewer will be involved in juvenile justice, 59 fewer will be teen parents, and the lifetime benefit per child of being enrolled in our program, provided they don't become parents, provided they're not engaged in juvenile justice and going on to a life in and out of prison, and provided that they are launching into being fully employed professional people contributing, saves $971,000 per child enrolled in our system because they are not dependent on social services and public assistance because we have launched them successfully. This was a number um, calculated by the Harvard Business School of Oregon, um, and I will tell you uh, front and center that statistic was calculated in 2014. Um, and so we know with costs of living, we know with costs of services, um, and in particularly things that have been escalated during the pandemic, this number is likely very outdated and has increased um, in the last few years. So these people, these people are who we are today, uh, but we're growing. Our organization, our organization is expanding to serve more kids in more places and in more ways. Our empty slots here, we will be hiring an eighth friend who will be dedicated to the, the Lapine community this fall. They will have a roster of kids enrolled at Lapine Elementary and or Roslyn Elementary. Um, we are working in collaboration with them, Lapine Schools, to make sure that they have access to classrooms and a space after school to be helping kids catch up. Um, this last position here in education and family specialist, um, that is because we've recognized how much uh, ground was lost during the pandemic and during distance learning, especially for our kids who were already on the cusp 
with school, they lost even more ground shifting to distance learning. The platform either wasn't effective for them as learners or, quite frankly, they didn't have access to the technology to participate fully in distance learning. They didn't have access to consistent people at, in their house every day who said, now's the time to log on and do school. Uh, so they have even more ground to make up. So we're dedicating a position um, to one this summer to be engaging in, uh, in assessment of our kids. Uh, we're going to figure out where they are grade level wise as readers and as mathematicians. Um, and then each child will have an individualized learning plan in, in collaboration with their teacher um, and parents moving into the next school year so we can get them caught up. Um, that position, the education and family specialist, we actually had, oh, she's up there. Colleen up in the top left corner is one of our friends. Um, she's a licensed elementary school teacher. Uh, and so she's going to be providing that individualized attention for all the kids in our program. And then the ranch. The ranch is probably what most of you remember us for. Um, the Qantas Club very generously gifted us $10,000 to install a sprinkler system in our facility. Um, at the onset of the pandemic, our landlord for our original clubhouse, which was on Empire in the North End of Bend in this corporate business park, um, our landlord wanted to raise our rent, and we weren't going to the office anyway at that time, so we ended our lease, we packed up all our stuff, and we began looking for our forever home. Um, the vision of a ranch to be serving kids in Central Oregon was at the heart of forming our organization, and we took it as an opportunity to make it a reality. The property we found is just shy of 20 acres and is about five miles south on Old Ben Redman Highway. I want to extend a personal invitation to any of you to come visit, come see the magic that we engage in every day with our kids there. Um, it, is, it is an incredibly special place that can... Uh, that can be understood only through a story. Um, so we have we have a kiddo on in our program who uh, let's call him bouncy. He's a very bouncy kid. He has a really hard time sitting still in school. He has an, an even harder time sitting still in his outings with his friend. Um, and one day his friend picked him up and said, "Hey, we just bought the ranch. Do you want to go see it? Do you want to go see our new clubhouse?" And the kid, oh yes, let's go. And they're driving up the highway. He can hardly keep his seatbelt on. The friend has to pull over to get him belted again and continues on. And he's looking and screaming, is it there? Is it there? Is that it? Is that it? And then they pull to the driveway and they turn down. We've got this beautiful long gravel driveway. And this child who can't sit still is immediately calm. He's immediately calm and quiet. And his friend parks the car and looks back in the back seat and says, buddy, what's going on? Are you okay? Are you okay? What's happening? Talk to me. And in the quietest voice, this child says, you didn't tell me it was a whole house. <laughs> this child, like so many of our kids, doesn't know what having a yard is like. They live in a one-bedroom apartment with four siblings and a single working mom and had no idea that the place he gets to come to with his friend for the next 10 years is a whole house and 20 acres of fun and magic that he will not have access to with any other piece or experience in his life. So it is through this space that you all helped make possible that we're able to offer, offer this experience to today, 46, by the end of summer, 51 kids, by the, end of, um, by the end of the calendar year, 61 youth will be coming to this place um, on a regular basis to access our program and services. So when we look past the metrics, we spend a lot of time talking about our data and our outcomes, which is incredibly important for a program like ours that exists over a long period of time. We are working toward today, toward outcomes that we won't know we've hit for another eight years. Um, and so what do I want to see and hear, really, for our kids? Um, I, I want to see and hear that they are still able to articulate their dreams. I want to see and hear that they can imagine 
a future that is better than their present. And that they know if they persist um, and continue to work with their friend, that they're going to get there. So now I have this sappy little music video. We can't do this work alone. I'm here to say thank you for helping make it possible for us to do what we do. Um, we rely on the hearts of community to help us do this work. Um, so thank you. Thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you for everything you continue to do for our community. Friends of the children aside, I recognize and honor the impact that clubs like yours have had on generations of people in Central Oregon. So from us to you, thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah? So uh, any governmental money or agencies involved with you directly? Uh, it, do you mean funding mm -hmm. yes. dollars? Uh, so during, during the pandemic, we have been the recipient of federal dollars through the CARES Act and now through ARPA because of our work in school systems, because we're helping with educational achievement. Um, and so the Department of Education and the Oregon Health Authority has helped um, fund our work because they recognize that we're achieving things with kids that classrooms aren't. Um, so we have accepted federal dollars in the last uh, two years um, as a part of that. Um, they also were making available, so we acted as a community-based organization, one of hundreds in the state of Oregon, to provide wraparound support, families who, um, who's, who lost their jobs, who um, were, would have otherwise uh, been out of their homes and, and things. We helped with rental payments and, and assistance, so we facilitated that not just for our families, but for hundreds of families in the region. We had a bucket of money that we dispersed to make those payments at the onset of the pandemic. That, uh, that funding went, was done the fall of 2021. Um, so outside those two sources, 97% uh, of our funding is private. Uh, the Deschutes County gives us $20,000 a year as a nonprofit organization, but other than that. Yeah, yeah. yeah follow up. Follow up <laughs> Has your model, uh, and it sounded like it was, is it national now? Mm -hmm. Is it um, making any impact on people who need to be paying attention to the fundamental things you do? Tell me what you I'm mean. thinking about Chicago and places where it's rampant. Yeah. We have a chapter in Chicago. We have a chapter in Harlem. Mm -hmm. We have a chapter in LA County. Um, Seattle, all of the kind of major metropolitan areas, we have a chapter in. Um, I think what's important or distinctive about our model um, is, is one, we, we offer a really intense level of service for kids. Uh, that intense level of service is, is relatively expensive. Yeah. Um, so when we think about, we're very often compared to big brothers, big sisters. Um, and so when we think about the cost per kid that our program requires, because we are paying our mentors and training them um, in background of, of working with kids in trauma, um, it, it just is a more expensive program. Uh, and so where, where Big Brothers Big Sisters is boasting helping millions of kids per year, that isn't true for our model nationally. Uh, because that intensive level of service. Our biggest chapter in Portland has 360 kids that they work with in a year, uh, but that's, that is relatively small in the world. 
if you apply though the metrics you talked about in the savings yeah. of, of taking care of those kids if they don't get exactly. I mean the, the net in the end along with a changed life is a model that works yeah. and ultimately uh, changes the dynamic instead of all the stuff that's going on throwing money exactly ideally um, in terms of our funding structure where, where I would like to see our organization go is that we've proven we're, we're vastly more um, impactful and successful in this work than a lot of public agencies who sit in this work with us um, and so if I, I would never want to downplay the power of private investment, but I do feel really strongly that we're better at what we do than, than many folks who work in child welfare. Um, and so if we are able to sit with data and activities, and, and really all we need is to hire the people to, to work in this model and deliver this model to the kids who need it the most, um, that partnership should be funded uh, that that public funding that's going to an agency that isn't driving this kind of change for these kids, if we could divert a small amount our way, it would be exponential. Um, so I, I, I am very leery of public funding. It, it tends to make a bigger mess than what it's worth. Um, but if we can negotiate something along those lines, I would really love to be, um, I would love to be proven wrong yeah. That we can't do this on a greater scale. As I see it. Screens. I just wanted to ask a quick <clears throat> question about the friends. Do they go to college before they have your training? And then do they sign a contract to make their commitment to stay 12 years? Yeah, so that is a great question and one I get every time. Um, one, all of our friends have either achieved their college degree or they are, they are two years in and are working toward completion. So we have that requirement for the position. Uh, they must have a college degree really as a model for these kids. You have to be able to show how to move into what that next stage is post high school. And if you haven't done that yourself, how are you going to teach your kids? So we put a, an emphasis on that requirement at the outset. Um, the second piece in terms of a, a contract, Oregon is an at-will state. We can't require anyone to stay in a job for 12 years, even with a contract, we can't. Um, and that's true really across the country. Um, no, no chapter in existence today makes friends sign an intention, I will stay here for 12 years. Um, that would, that would be, I wouldn't actually approve of that practice anyway. Um, on average, across our network, we see friends staying between four and five years is the average. Um, it is really clear in our interview process that, um, that you're committing verbally and not seeing anything in your future that would prohibit you from staying shorter than three years. Um, so that's part of, of the interview process for us and I know across the country. And that's what they do. Um, life, life happens. We lost three of our seven friends during the pandemic um, because they wanted to move back to their families because families had gotten sick and needed to, to take care of them. Because of what happened to the cost of living in Central Oregon, they were not able to find housing themselves. Um, so that, as leader of an organization, that means I need to raise more money so we can pay these people more um, so they can afford to live and stay here and do this work with us um, and then and then honestly the one that breaks my heart the most is is the young man who left because moving to virtual um, so we had we had a period of six or seven months where from our national organization the recommendation was don't see kids in person um, maintain contact so we were using phones and iPads and and things to chat with them we were dropping in addition to food boxes we were dropping play kits and activity kits off to our kids, but our model changed really drastically in those early days because of, of lockdown parameters. Um, and we lost a guy during that time who said, I can't do this job virtually. This is an in-person, I'm in it with you no matter what job. And you're not letting me do that. So he left, which was heartbreaking, it was heartbreaking. Um, 
Um, and so that's my commitment to this organization and to our kids. We're going to find a way. We're not going to repeat any of the stuff that's happened in the last two years. Our kids are traumatized enough. They don't need to go through that again. And they need to trust that we and their friends are there no matter what. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Sorry, I got food in my mouth. No. <laughs> um, so just supposing, just supposing we were to um, adopt one of your caregiver people, just so that we could support them, maybe the, the money they need for incidentals to make better mm -hmm. trips and things with the kids, to better interactions, they'd have some funds to do that. And then they could come tell us how great it was. Heck yeah. Do you do something like that? 100%. And you're talking about adopting one of our friends, right? Or do you mean yeah, our family? Yeah, all the friends. Yeah. Um, so they, they would love that. And I absolutely, uh, next time, I'm going to bring a friend to talk about their experience. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. We work in partnership for whatever you'd like to do. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. We'd like to gift you one of our beautifully handcrafted oh, pens. You awesome. Can select the fit and finish. You don't have to take a picture now. Gosh, you that's a touch. Decide. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going with the copper. I great. wanted to make just a follow-up comment. And this was before Rachel's time, but five years ago, um, I was on the development committee at Friends mm -hmm. of the Children. And I I want to say they only had three friends at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, our original right? hire was three. Yep, and we've grown to now and eight. None of those three are here any longer. I don't recognize any of those faces from those original three. True, true. One moved into a development role for yeah. us, but has moved on since then to people. Mm -hmm. Sir. Yeah. Um, but more than that, I, I've been a monthly giver yeah. since, I mean, since the beginning. And I just, the, the organization's fantastic. I believe in it. <clears throat> and um, I stepped back from the development committee simply because of a time commitment. Uh, but I really believe in it. I think what they do is fantastic. There's nothing else like it, regardless of boys, and, you know, girls. Or, um, what do we say? Big brothers, big sisters. Yep. All, all the similarities are there, but uh, this is just such a, a forgive the term, superior um, organization because no just, forgiveness needed. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, ideally, uh, the, the hands-on approach is just so much better, and having a paid mentor um, does more guarantee that hand-holding experience each kid needs. Um, you're not going to have a flaky volunteer. So anyway, I'll just close with that. Um, thank you guys. Have a wonderful week, and we will see you all again. Oh, Carl, results. Oh, oh, and then we'll see you all next okay. week. Okay. Uh, first the commercial, I have extra posters for the vendors' dinner at July 3rd. Short commercial. OK, the uh, four new board members are Earl, Truman, Allen, and Dan. Congratulations. And with that, have a good week. <laughs>